Hello, this is Nice Wander, and welcome to the Now Man Show. Samuel Ronan was a 2016 Democratic candidate for District 62 of the Ohio House of Representatives, who also sought election to the U.S. House to represent the 1st Congressional District of Ohio. In 2017, he was a candidate for the chair of the Democratic National Committee. He started a social media network called Our Voice. Sam, welcome to the Now Man Show. How's it going? Hey, welcome to be here. Thank you. Thank you. And so we're going to start this uh, interview discussion with uh, Sam Ronan in action. We need to fight. And we don't need to do it timidly. We don't need to do it mildly. We need to do it aggressively. Because that's what they've done to us. What do you think ALEC is? That's a Republican organization that is shoving conservative beliefs and uh, policies down the throats of legislators all across the country. And now they have won. They have won in Ohio. They have won in the Rust Belt states. They have won all over the country. And we are being <laughs> held by the throat by these people. So no, we will fight. And unfortunately, to answer the question directly and succinctly, yes, protesting is the way forward. Why? Because it's finally being effective. We have to protest, we have yeah. to organize, because that's the only thing left to us. Right. If we could get people to get elected into office and maintain their integrity and actually do what they said they would do, we wouldn't have to protest, because it would be getting done. But it's not. And who's the ones going out there fighting? The ones who are passionate, the ones who have been ignored, the Berniecrats, the Millennials, and the New Democrats and Independents who have never had a voice before. So as DNC chair, you bet, I will help organize those protests and I'll make sure the doors are open to men and women like me and everybody else here who are finally at the table. A lot of people believe that what the party needs is a generational choice. You're the two youngest people sitting up on this stage. Does the Democratic Party need to pass the baton to the next generation? And are you the ones, are you the ones to take it? Make, make the case for why the party should hand off control to somebody of your generation, Mr. Ronan and then Mr. Mayor. Well, Pete, what do you think? You think we're the next generation, we next generation of leaders here? Of course we are. That's not the question. The question is, are we finally going to get a place at the table? I ran for state representative. I served my country in the Air Force for seven years. I served overseas, and now I'm a reservist. I am still serving my country while doing this. Why? Because it matters. Because I care. Because we believe in service. And every single millennial out there has the most vested interest in our future. And if we don't give them the chance to step up, if we don't mentor them to step up, and if we don't give them the tools to succeed, we will fail. So it's a little self-serving to say that, yep, we absolutely need a millennial up here on the DNC chair, but in a sense, it's true. Because we grew up in a great economy that we watched get destroyed. We saw the technology boom. We saw everything that has changed in our country since the 90s. We are probably one of the most diverse and versatile people because of that. We have the drive. We have the passion. And we've seen that in the Bernie Kratz. We've seen that with the progressives. And we've seen that with all of these local candidacies that have been going on. I ran for state representative. I got out of active duty Air Force to run for state representative. And I had no tools at my disposal. I asked my party for help and they couldn't deliver. I asked them for just contact information for local news media couldn't give me anything. How can I win? How can you win? How can we as millennials win if we don't have the tools to succeed? The one thing we haven't been discussing is how do you in the room get to affect us here at the table? Many of you may or may not know that it's only DNC members that get to vote. So why has that not been discussed yet? If we're going to change this party and make it for the people, should we or should we not make it for the people? I know I might be shooting my foot and I'm not trying to. I'm trying to reach out to you and encourage you to think about that future. We are the future. He's the future. All of us here in this room need a voice and we need the ability to succeed. All right, Sam, great to see you. Um, so we just watched a clip uh, of you in action at the debate there. Uh, so I guess you consider yourself a progressive, right? Yeah, I mean, I feel like the things that I'm doing are for the greater good, and that's what progressivism means nowadays. Yeah, and, and you know, uh, I also was born and raised in, in uh, Middle America, actually born in Ohio, in the area where you're from. Um, so, yeah, Buckeye. Uh, so 
I understand, you know, being from middle America, I actually lived in three parts of it. So you, people look at life differently than they do on the coast. So, so you are a progressive and you're a real minority and yet you, oh, you're, yeah. you're amongst, technically wouldn't you say though that you're amongst a majority feeling like a minority politically? Oh yeah, and, and that's the funny thing. Uh, when I ran for state representative, uh, whenever I talked about single payer healthcare, single payer education, I always had the door slammed in my face. But when I talked about affordable health care or I talked about uh, school to work programs, all of a sudden people like to hear what I had to say. It's how you deliver the message. It's not that progressive ideals aren't being held by conservatives or Democrats. It's that how do you reach them? And that's where um, I've learned that you have to translate progressivism into conservative or into moderate, uh, as the case may be. You know, and I'm noticing that apparently there's still a lot of people who think that uh, discussing politics means primarily focusing on personalities, you know, like uh, Donald Trump or even the Republican Party and the Democratic Party, and, and, and we're not getting into issues and policies, and there's a reason for that in my view. What do you think? I think you're absolutely right, and I, we might even agree on what the reason is. It's because divisiveness is exactly what those in power want. If we focused on the issues, they would lose their jobs instantly. Exactly. And, and it's not because um, they're just hateful, evil people. It's that they are counting on ignorance and they're counting on low voter turnout. We had 9% of the population show up to vote for the presidential election, which is exactly why we have a very conservative Congress, Senate, uh, now Supreme Court and executive branch all across the country. Um, if we focused on issues, it wouldn't matter if you were a Democrat or Republican, you would be able to unite with your friends or your neighbors based on what you believe in. And by doing that, right, you would completely disrupt the entire duopoly process, the, the left versus right, the Republicans versus Democrats. If all of a sudden people were crossing the aisle and working together, whoa, we would have too many people uh, having a voice to be heard. And um, we might be getting into this later on in the thing, but that's exactly the, uh, the argument I was making when I ran for state rep when I ran for Congress very, very briefly, and when I ran for the DNC chair race, and now while I'm the Our Voice founder. It, the, the message has been the same. Uh, granted, it's only been the same for about a year and a half, yeah. but we have to start focusing on the big picture, and right now that's policies. It's that we have a stronger voice than the Republicans or the Democrats, and we need to start exercising it. And you made a very uh, good point when you mentioned in the debate in the, the you know, progressives, millennials, and Berniecrats you know, have to be have to have the tools to succeed, right? Mm -hmm. So, and, and you also on another uh, I think interview or, or debate that I, I saw you say something about all that we have left is going to the streets. Do you agree with that? I mean, it, that is absolutely the truth. And you know, when I said we need the tools to succeed, that was that was talking from personal experience. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm still having a bit of a falling out with my county chair. Uh, not not because I have anything against her. Um, but because, unfortunately, she disagrees with my conclusions to the, the party's issues, right? Yeah. If I go to her as my county chair and say, hey, I need your help. I need this list of contacts so I can make the connections. I can do the press things. I can do literally everything. I just need to know who they are. And they can't provide that. That's not my fault. And that's not me asking for a handout. That is literally the party failing to fulfill its own obligation to its constituents and to its candidates. Like, why have a party at all if you're not gonna actually help them or if you can't actually help them, right? And so to your other point, um, if, if we have nothing less left to do other than take it to the streets, then you're right. That's what we have to do. If I, first of all, most of these um, uh, speeches that I've been giving at, at schools and whatnot, I, I always ask the question, how many of you know how to uh, run for mayor? And you know, one person raises their hand. Wow. That's the problem, yeah. I would, and, and I'm telling you, this happened in Utah, this happened in Kent State University, this happened, um, where, where else have I been recently? Well, I don't know. I, I've been to a few places in the yeah. meantime, and I always ask the question, where have you been, or do you know how to run for office? And the answer is overwhelmingly no. Wow. And even those who are running for office are like, I don't know how to file my paperwork. I don't know how to start a, cam a campaign committee. I don't know how to register. I don't know how to do this, that, or the other. And it's like, how can we possibly win elections? How can we possibly move this progressive movement forward if we can't even do the basics, which is get on the ballot? 
And see, people fail to realize. It's like, no, we have to organize, organize, organize. Well, organization doesn't isn't this magical word or turn of phrase where unicorns come prancing off of rainbows and yeah. deliver us leprechaun gold. Organizing is working together and finding these things out together and then supporting one another. Um, and that's not what's been happening. And, and so right. we're left to protest and, and do our activist things. But unfortunately, and I say unfortunately, what does protesting actually accomplish? Absolutely nothing. It has not achieved a single thing. Because if it did, the DAPL protest would have been the single most effective protest in American history. That's right. But they've been vilified. They've been attacked. They've been outright attacked. They've been ignored. And now they've been pushed yep. out of Ocheti. And that pipeline is now getting built. Even after almost, what, two years worth of protesting? Granted, the No Ban, No Wall protest, the Women's March, Black Lives Matter, some of those have had some effect, but has legislation been passed? Have people lost their jobs? Have people re been replaced or forced to resign? Have elections been won because of these things? And the unfortunate answer is no. Activism and protesting is one step. And if we're going to do it peacefully, it's one step additional that we have to take. We have to show petitions, we have to show action, we have to bring legislative proposals. Like, we have to do more. And unfortunately, it's not being done. Yeah, and, and a lot of changes have to be made. We're gonna get into that discussion in a panel discussion later. Uh, we, you know, the system is, is mm -hmm. the problem. And, and the is. system's gonna have to be changed. And, and the, <clears throat> many of us, uh, and mainly a lot of the millennials, they understand that. You know, and recently, by the way, Noam Chomsky, you got to love that man. He's written over 100 books, but recently he was on uh, with uh, Amy Goodman on Democracy Now. And for those of you who may not know who Noam Chomsky is, again, to this point, uh, you don't know who Noam Chomsky is. He's been a teacher of linguistics at MIT and a political analyst for over 50 years, still teaching, still doing it, still doing his media work. And he made an interesting observation at the end of his interview with Amy recently where he talked about the rise of fascism in this country. Mm -hmm. And there, and we need to be educated about the history of that and, and what, who better could do that than Noam Chomsky. And he made a point that I thought was very interesting uh, that um, when Joseph McCarthy, you know, uh, his style, he was a thug, basically, mm -hmm. if you analyze uh, Richard Nixon was uh, a crook, right? Uh, and both of those guys, you know, uh, ended their their careers, you know, in in uh, failure, basically disgrace, right? Yeah. And it, now he says, now we have Donald Trump, who's a clown. And he said <sighs> the next time something like this happens, it could be worse, where the general public doesn't see it. And that is scary. Uh, there's a quote from um, uh, I don't Richard Wolf see much here. Worse than what we already have. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and he made a very good point. And Richard Wolf, I want to get your thoughts on this. Uh, we'll see another clip from him during the panel discussion. Uh, he's a uh, another professor of economics at New School, and, and um, I've interviewed him before. Um, this quote: "Resistance has quickly become the watchword." Uh, of an impressive opposition to the Trump-Bannon government and its fascist potential. However, the lessons of capitalism's dysfunctional politics will have gone unlearned if opposition remains at the level of resisting this particular administration. Exchanging the Trump-Bannon regime for return to normal, in quotes, capitalism, returns us to the, precisely the system that produced Trump and Bannon. Okay. So what are your thoughts on that? Well, I thought you were going to actually give the quote that when fascism uh, comes to America, it'll be, hold, or it'll be holding the Bible and wrapped in the American flag. I believe that's how that quote goes. And we're seeing that today. Yep. Um, I've actually made the point to call it the modern day crusades because we're the Christian nation attacking the Muslim Middle East and calling them terrorists and this, that, and the other to justify going over there even though the, the real reasons would be oil and other, you know, keeping the, the, the Middle East um, as unstable as possible. Uh, war proliferation, arms proliferation. But to your point, um, yeah, he, he's not wrong. Uh, I think, I don't think I've made that point yet, but, you know, it's, it's very obvious that if going back to the status quo is the best that we can achieve, then all we're doing is delaying the inevitable. And I think it's actually 
I think we're, it's pretty safe to say at this point, we are very quickly heading towards fascism with the Trump and an administration. Uh, not because we're not there already. I think we are there in many ways already. For instance, he declared that attack without any congressional oversight. That is an abuse and overreach of executive power that hasn't been checked by Congress because it just so happened to go along with what they wanted anyway. So nope. at what point does that line get drawn? Well, it should have been drawn uh, the day after Inauguration Day when he eliminated uh, middle-class housing benefits. That was part of the Obama administration. Yep. He's going out of his way to dismantle the entire legacy of the Obama administration. He tried passing Trump care, which would have literally killed a quarter of the country. And that isn't even hyperbole. That is a fact. Um, so to, when you say things like, oh, this is just the tip of the iceberg, and then next time it happens, it can be worse, that just... I, first of all, I'm afraid we're not even going to make it to a next time. And second of all, if next time is worse, what the hell is worse? Right. Like, we we would literally be worse than Nazi Germany at that point. Like, the only thing separating us from them right now is gas chambers. And it didn't start with gas chambers. It That's right. It started with attacking public policy. It started with... That's propaganda. right. It started with um, attacking... Uh, the press and the media. So I think that's, that that's exactly the point that that uh, Chomsky was trying to make, as well as Wolf, is that you know yes it can get worse, and we know how it can get worse. We saw that in the 1930s and 1940s. Um, let's uh, we're actually already running out of time. I love this conversation. We'll continue more okay. with the panel, but let's get into uh, talking about issues. What. And I know millennials are concerned about obviously education, and there's also the Medicare for all, uh, which you know most of the world has some kind of yeah. single payer program, and even Saudi Arabia and Israel does. Uh, transition from fossil fuels, we need jobs. Half the work, half the country is not really working as they should be. They're not, I should say, as I like to say, financially comfortable or stable. Uh, we need to get the money out of the politics. There's so many things, and nothing is really being addressed. Or, or done. What are your thoughts about that? Um, I don't know if this is the part where I can plug a little bit of our voice, but that's yes. the thing. We thank you. Um, our voice. That whole premise of what you just said. There's so many things that need getting done, but none of them are, and that's yeah. because the people in power are vested in not doing it. I mean, we that's just right. saw what Rick Scott. He's the Florida governor, if I'm not mistaken. Right. He just sent everybody to drug test again and found one guilty person. Out of millions of dollars spent, one guilty person. Yep. And guess what? It's because he has a vested interest in the drug testing company. Right. So you multiply that by literally the military, military industrial complex, uh, the fact that we have an ExxonMobil former CEO as the head of the EPA. Yes. And then dismantling Tillerson. And then, you know, all these other, you know, just people who have a vested interest in not moving forward, those are the ones in power. So we must get rid of them. Uh, but how do we get rid of them? Well, gerrymandering is such a big problem. Well, yes and no. Gerrymandering is a problem because of the traditional way of politics. You're yeah. red or you're blue. Well, guess what? If you make it about policy, red or blue doesn't really matter. That's because right. whoever's running on, on, on the ballot as, it, as challenging them in their incumbency is the one that you should support. And just for the sake of argument, let's say you're an incumbent, Dan, and let's just say you're the worst thing to ever happen to America, and I run against you, but it's you're the incumbent, and then there's the other guy running as well. Well, that makes three well-known, well, well-respected candidates running for office. Well, you're the incumbent, so you should be getting all the votes anyway, and the other guy's going to get the other guy's votes, right? So where do I fall into play? 43% of a country is either nonpartisan or independent, meaning they aren't Republican or Democrat. Now, the fact that only 9% ever do show up to vote in the first place, if we turned out the vote of just the 42% of Americans to actually show up and double or triple or quintuple the actual turnout, we would win by a landslide. It doesn't matter about gerrymandering. We just have to get people that we want to support elected into office and support them and highlight and, them. And don't you think there's also the strategy, too, because, you know, I've looked at the most recent data, uh, the Gallup poll data as of March the 1st, 2017, and 42% uh, uh, of the people in that poll say they are independent. Uh, 30 Democrat and 26%, uh, I believe, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, Republican. So, and of course, then you have to allow like 4% uh, for the margin of error, which is always what they do. But that tells me that uh, thinking, again, strategically outside the box, just right. to better understand something, 
first of all, you have the first, the largest block is independent, right? But there's got to be, especially when it comes to economic politics, which I like to talk, I like to put those two words together because we don't do it enough, and that's what we have to do to understand this. If you talk about things like economic politics, which unlike social justice, and let's say, you know, really involves everyone in some way or another, okay, that means that's where the two parties are actually bipartisan. So if you put those two together, then guess who's the majority? You Still know, and I've honest. talked to people about that, like, you know, so that's why you see maybe, uh, you know, this drift to the right politically, you know, and it just, so let's talk about Bernie Sanders real briefly. I know we all were, sure. many of us, you know, in this show, we talked about Bernie Sanders a lot uh, during the primaries. Um, what is Bernie Sanders trying to do? Is he trying to reform the Democratic Party? What is he trying to do? Well, do if I were ever able to speak on behalf of Bernie Sanders, my imagination would say that he is trying to reform the Democratic Party. The problem is the way he's going about doing it isn't going to achieve that goal. He's yeah. working lockstep with the party, whereas he should be dragging them left. He should be dragging them to the left. Yeah. And I've had this conversation with, well, if Hillary Clinton got elected, we'd have the same problems. I'm like, yes and no. Now, would she have probably attacked Syria? I guess that's one thing she would have done, considering she went on public to talk about that. But here's the thing, a Democratic president whether neoliberal or not, or right of center or left of center, is still a Democrat and is still left-leaning, meaning their constituency is on the left. And the more to the left your president or your leadership is, the happier your constituency is. So if we had gotten Hillary, we could have pushed her to the left and drug her to the left, kicking and screaming as it may have been, but we could have done that. Donald Trump has absolutely no incentive to go left at all. And the further extreme right he goes, the more support he gets, as we're seeing. What's the most conservative or Republican thing you can do is attack another country, using our sons and daughters to fight uh, frivolous wars on, you know. But do you think that that isn't basically, though, a bipartisan issue? I mean, like you mentioned, oh, you, you said yourself, you know, that Hillary Clinton would have supported that. And here's another thing that I think is a bipartisan issue that people, you know, became aware of, at least on, on the left, the progressives on the left, when Bernie Sanders was proposing, you know, uh, the, the Canadian pharmaceutical companies to be able to be comp <laughs> to compete in the market, right, yeah. to get the that costs awesome. down. And guess more Democrats voted f against that than Republicans. That's because the, the, that they sounds pretty bipartisan to me, don't you think? I mean, right. The corruption is absolutely bipartisan, yeah. and there lies the problem. See, I, I've made this point quite a lot. It's the weakness and the cowardice of people in office, and I will say it again and again and again. Corruption only exists because the people in power allow themselves to be bought out for pennies on the dollar. And I say pennies on the dollar because any given senator or congressman represents either several hundred thousand or several million people at any given time. And they're taking $300,000 donations, $20,000 donations, $50,000 donations yes. to vote against something that would benefit not just their constituency, but the entire country. So you're talking $300,000 in correlation or comparison to 318 million people, that's not even a penny a person. Like, right. That is corruption, that's weakness, that is pitiful. And if we got people like you and me to actually get into office, we would be immune to such things because like, no, if you're gonna buy me out, if you're gonna sell my soul, I'm gonna make you pay top dollar. Like you better be giving me a billion dollars or something because nothing short of that is acceptable. I'm not gonna just sacrifice my children, my friends or my neighbors for twenty thousand dollars in campaign funds, I think not. But isn't I'm that make sure. so? Sorry. Isn't that basically how the oligarchy works, though? So when it really comes down oh, yeah. to it, behind closed doors, people care about their own careers, their own right. bank accounts, and then they don't really, maybe at the end of the day, care whether you vote Democrat, Republican, if you're right or you're left or whatever. Or it's about me. It, it's this is this is more like megalomania to me. And right, which lies. you obviously aren't because you know, you know right. you go on the stage there at the DNC, and you're not wearing the suit and the tie, you're wearing what, something from Target or whatever. Exactly. You know what I mean? And, and the average person can relate to that, but the oligarchy can't relate to that. The oligarch it's, oligarchy doesn't look at that as success. That's completely a, a false perspective of the reality of what's going on, 
which they want us to focus on. And they call that their strength, but it's also That's right. their greatest weakness. And we should be taking full advantage of that. If, if you or I ran for office, well, I mean, I will run for office eventually. Um, but, you know, if we got, there's what, 500,000 races in the country that are ballot access. If we got regular people to fill each and every single one of those spots and then highlighted it, either through a network, through an organization, through whatever, the Dan Newman show, right? I mean, it doesn't matter how we do it. <laughs> as long as we do it, we win because we outnumber them. Like, that's what I, that's, that's right. what frustrates me so much. People are like, we need to organize. Like, no, the organization's already there. What we need to do is start doing the work. So we let's, can't oversaturate things. That's the problem. So, so let's, let's, let's wrap this up. Tell us some more about uh, our voice and what your goals are and then how people can uh, find out more about that and, and connect with you. Awesome. So I pulled up a, a flyer that uh, a, my team uh, wrote. Holly, she's an outstanding uh, graphic designer. Great. Um, basically, I'm, I'm just going to read off of it. She said, your voice combined with my voice becomes our voice. Uh, this is our initiative. Our voice is bringing movements and groups together to get on the same page and provide a common toolbox of strategy, policy, organizing, and funding resources for citizens and newly well-vetted candidates who want to take on the establishment. And that's exactly what we are. We're going to do it through um, online social media strategizing, like you were saying earlier. But more than that, we're going to have boots on the ground. We're going to have a 50-state strategy and a 3,000-plus county strategy. We already have something starting in Los Angeles. We're getting something started in Cincinnati. Um, I've been working with several uh, prominent figures in my own area that we're going to be vetting uh, and endorsing. So we're already doing the work. We have the structure. We have the toolkits. We have the advice. We, we're showing you exactly how to run a campaign. We're translating the progressive agenda into conservative and moderate. Why? Because we run in rural counties. We run in moderate America. And we're going to win on a progressive message. We just need to be able to reach our people. And further than that, we're going we're gonna to make sure that you have the access to get on the ballot. So no matter where you are, you know how to run. We're going to have volunteer sign-up sheets. We're going to have candidate sign-up sheets. We're going to have uh, email lists that the candidates themselves can use that'll be honed uniquely to them based on platform issues. Another thing we're building is a canvassing and GOTV app where it's going to be door-to-door. -door, it's going to be online. You sign up and you say, hey, my name is Bob, and these are the things I care about. And you go to the next one and say, hi, my name is Jill. These are the things I care about. And on and on the line until we see a heat map of what LA cares about, what Springboro cares about, what New York City cares about. And then we're gonna hone our campaigns to do exactly that. Focus on those issues, which revolutionizes the entire way the campaigns have been ran. The second, or I guess the next, the last part is how to get on the ballot in the first place. Well, guess what? California is great. You can run as a liberal, you can run as a Republican, or you can run as an independent or Green Party and get on yes. the ballot. It's different in Ohio. Ohio. In Ohio, not so much. So you get to choose between Republican or Democrat. Well, guess what? Just because you have an R or a D next to your name doesn't matter. What matters is your support structure, our voice, is the one pushing you forward. And if how can people Democrat, find out more about our voice? Where can they find it? We have that? a website. We have a website, uh, ourvoiceinitiative.org. You can find us on Our Voice USA on Twitter and Our Voice USA on Facebook. Um, on that website, you'll see literally everything. The, an outline of what we do, what we stand for, our platform issues, and some uh, like materials to hand out as well. That flyer I just said, available online, free to you to proliferate as much as you'd like. Cool, cool. Thank you so much, Sam. This is Nice Wonder Now Man Show with Samuel Ronan. Outstanding. Thanks for having me. My pleasure.